All right, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. My name is Boris Herzl. I am the program manager for Guam PTAC, the Procurement Technical Assistance Center. This slide here tells you a little bit about what we do. Um, actually, before I get started, if you have any problems with the slides, if you can't see the slides, if you're having problems with the audio, usually the best thing to do is just log out and log back in. Uh, but if, if that doesn't work, um, send us a, a, an email or in the chat, send us a, a message in the chat. All right, so um, Guam PTAC is funded by a grant from the Defense Logistics Agency and the University of Guam hosts our program. And we're here to provide one-on-one -on -one counseling as well as group workshops and webinars for companies that are going after government contracts. So if you're going after federal government contract or a local government contract, we're here to assist you. Like I mentioned, we are sponsored by a grant from DOD, University of Guam hosts our program. Um, we also have some in-kind sponsors for our program. Bank of Guam gave us office space and Francine and, uh, is over at that office right now. Frank, our other counselor is on leave till May, but he'll be back in May hopefully and everything will be great. And then GTA provides us our cell phones and communications and internet over at the bank. So thank you very much for GTA. Some of the highlights of our program, we have over 600 active clients. In FY21, those clients won over $180 million in contracts and subcontracts with the government. And we've helped a bunch of clients get HUBZone certified. It's one of the easier certifications to get for Guam-based businesses, just because the entire island is a hub zone and all your employees reside in a hub zone. So you don't have to worry about those um, qualifications or those eligibility factors that sometimes disqualify companies in the state. So. Some of the partners we work with, the SBA, um, the Hub Zone program is one of their programs. Uh, there are a bunch of other small business programs. There's the Woman Owned Small Business Certification, which is an official certification. The self certification went away about two years ago now. Um, there's the Service Aid of Veteran Owned Small Business Certification, which you know currently is a self certification, except for the VA. If you want to do business with the VA, you got to get certified through their program. Eventually, that will transition to the SBA. Uh, I think that's scheduled for 2023. And, so, and then there's also the 8A program for companies that are owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, as well as the small business mentor protege program. So small businesses can team up with large businesses and not have to worry about affiliation and rules like that if they get into that program and are approved by the SBA. If you want to know more about these programs, um, there is a webinar happening tomorrow, and the SBA Hawaii office is putting one together. I think it's at 10 or 11 tomorrow. We've put it on our Facebook page and we put it on our LinkedIn page. So you can just click that and, and register for that. It's free as well. And they'll give you basically all the eligibility requirements for the different small business certification programs. Um, the SBDC, they're one of our partners that we work with, the Small Business Development Center. So if you need help with business development, right, starting a business, expanding a business, putting a business plan together, uh, because you need to get a loan, right, from the bank, so they want a business plan. Um, if you need any help with uh, all the grants related to the pandemic, the PPP and the EIDL, I'm not sure which ones are still going or if they're all finished or not, but SBDC can help you with all those things. They focus on business development. Whereas the PTAC, we strictly focus on government contracting. So uh, just, you know, we don't help with private sector work. And then our other partner is APTAC, the Association of PTACs. So though every state has a PTAC, every, most states have multiple PTACs. Uh, and so we have this network that we can go to. CNMI has their own PTAC as well. And we have a network we can go to and find out what's going on and what problems are uh, going on. Like we were discussing right before this webinar with Sam, the big issue now that the DUNS number is gone. Um, so we have that um, association we can go to, uh, find out what's uh, going on with um, updates in federal contracting as well as problems. And usually we try to you know, help each other and find solutions to our problems through our association. So, all right, that's the Guam PTAC. All our services are free of charge. Uh, like I said, we're funded by a grant. So it's all paid for with your tax dollars already. So uh, please take advantage, go to our website, guamptac.com, sign up as a client. Uh, refer us to other businesses that uh, may need help with federal contracting and we'll do our best to help them. Okay, today we're gonna talk about, all right, again, if my computer cooperates, teaming and joint ventures. So before we get into that, I kind of want to discuss um, some small business goals the federal government has. And, and the reason for this is the government does, you know, although it may not seem that way sometimes, but they do have a general policy. It's in the FAR, which are the federal acquisition regulations. 
in FAR 19, where they say they want to provide maximum opportunities for small businesses, and then they list out the different categories. Uh, these are those are the small business certifications that I was discussing earlier that you can get. And um, the reason this relates to teaming and joint ventures, a lot of these um, small businesses to take advantage and grow in federal contracting, they usually team up with each other. And so um, I just wanted to discuss how there's tons of opportunities out there for small businesses. And there's actually a scorecard the government puts out for the various federal agencies and the government in whole as to how they did uh, achieving these goals. So the overall goal for small business contracting in the federal government is 23%. They want 23% of all government contracts to go to small businesses, and then they divide it up further, 5% to women-owned, 5% to small disadvantaged, those are the 8As, 3% uh, to service-stable veterans, and 3% to hub zones. So, and you can see um, a majority of the time, or, you know, the, the goals are hit government-wide, except for hub zones, which is, is pretty much the hardest goal for the government to hit. Um, it doesn't seem like that here on Guam, because... <laughs> You know, like I said, all the island is a hub zone and all our residents here, every, all your employees live in the hub zone. So um, the actual goals on Guam, so, you know, federal agencies, while the goal is 3%, they can go higher. And I believe NAVFAC, Marianas, their goal is somewhere in the 30% because they award a lot of hub zone contracts. And we'll discuss one coming up here uh, in the form of a MAC. But the point here is to show you there are tons of opportunities for small businesses. Uh, but one of the best ways to get these opportunities and take advantage of them is to team up with other small businesses. And we'll be discussing that in the upcoming slides here. So, um, And then here's the Department of Defense. So like I said, they break it down, the, the government-wide performance uh, in meeting the small business goals. Here's the Department of Defense. And so what do we do? They, they hit them all except for the hub zone. So more of a... I guess a stress here that if you're a federal contractor and you're not hub zone certified on Guam, you probably want to do it. It's just be, it's just one of the easier ones to get and it helps the government try to hit their goal. All right. Um, another way the government gets more businesses involved is to do something known as multiple award contracts, or in this case, multiple award construction contracts, otherwise known as MACs. You hear this all the time. And um, they're usually contracts where how they basically work is in the construction industry. Uh, if we're going to talk about max here, is the government has let's say a, a pile of money, right? Let's say they have uh, five hundred million dollars, and they need to spend it on a hundred different projects over the next five years. So what they do is instead of saying, you know what, we're going to go release a project out for bid, we'll let everyone bid on it, evaluate all the proposals. And then that's now we have 99 more projects and then we're going to do that again and then do the next one and the next one and the next one. They'll say, you know what, why don't we just consolidate all these projects into a pool and call it a MAC, a multiple award construction contract, basically. And how it'll work is we'll put one out uh, for bid. And then we'll have everyone bid on it. And then we'll, you know, maybe there'll be 20, 30, 50 bidders. And then we'll take the top five, six, eight, ten bidders, whoever we think can do the to can do the seed project that we released. And then going forward, only those top five, eight, or ten will be the bidders for the other ninety-nine projects that are part of this MAC over the next five years. And that's how a MAC works. And MACs are usually full of teams. There's a lot of teams involved. There's a lot of joint venturing involved because you know it's it's a lot of time that you're going to five years, sometimes seven years, sometimes eight years, sometimes ten years. Uh, that you're going to be um, doing this work. And normally com companies can't do it on their own. They need to team up with other companies. So max lead to a lot of teaming. That's the point here. Um, so let's discuss some of these max going on right now. So the, right now there are there is a service, uh, a small business design build MAC. That's what DB stands for. And these are the companies involved. And I believe there's another one that's supposed to be coming up here soon. And it's taking a while, so I'm not sure. Um, maybe there was some people protesting. Who knows? Sometimes that happens. Um, some companies maybe didn't like the, the solicitation process or something. But um, this is, so if you look at the Small Business Development Mac, let's look at the one in 2018 here. It was $400 million in this pot of money. And um, it's still going on actually ends in July of this year this is when it's scheduled to end might take a little longer usually they finish quicker and you can see there's five companies on this Mac and so only these five companies bid for the various task orders or projects that are associated with the Mac 
And I believe all of these are uh, Guam based companies. So that's great. Um, so point here is there's lots of opportunities and lots of opportunities for teaming, you know, prime sub relationship, that is a team, as well as joint venturing. And you can see some of the Mac winners in 2010, uh, that bull track Watts, that was a joint venture. Uh, Guam Pacific International LLC might have been a joint venture. A lot of joint ventures also form as LLCs instead of calling themselves JVs. So, uh, so that's uh, opportunities here if you're in the construction industry for getting involved in these Macs. Um, there's a hub zone Mac. Uh, so this one was just awarded, I believe, um, in January. I haven't seen any task orders um, go out yet. But you know, there's one of the caveats to that is the public information that's available for uh, these task orders. These are all through the Department of Defense, um, through the Navy, through NAVFAC. They're allowed to withhold their data for 90 days, so um, from the public. So we, there could have been some task orders already. I just haven't been able to uh, get that information yet. Uh, but you can see there's about 10 companies on this, and this MAC is going to go for eight years. So 400 million dollars, and all these companies are HubZone certified. And they all have teaming partners. I'm sure, you know, Agbani, Allied, BME, Fargo, all of them have preferred subcontractors that they like to work with. And so um, there's a bunch of teaming going on in these, in these contracts. When we get to the big, bigger max, you'll see that um, there's a bunch of joint venturing going on. Uh, there's the 8A max. So these are usually for smaller renovation type contracts. So the 2019 one, which ends in 2024, there's five companies on there. So again, this is just to point out the opportunity. There's lots of opportunities going on right here. And the Service Able Veteran Owned Small Business Back, MAC, which ended in 2021. I'm not sure if they're gonna do another one, um, but these are very, again, smaller projects, renovations, things like that. So hopefully there'll be a woman owned MAC one day. Um, we do have quite a few um, woman owned small business that are in the construction industry. So. Um, I don't see why they couldn't put a Mac together for that. Uh, but let's get into teaming now. So what exactly is teaming? Well, the FAR, again, the Federal Acquisitions Regulations define it as um, two or more companies form a partnership or JV to act as a prime contractor. Or, um, which is the uh, number two is what you normally see, a prime contractor agrees with one or more other companies to have the Mac as a sub. So a prime sub relationship is a team as well. Um, teaming is desirable for the government, right? Um, especially when the companies complement each other. That's those are the best kind of teams, right? Is when maybe um, let's say uh, I always like to use the example of a, a janitorial company uh, teaming up with a yard maintenance company. You know, maybe one company is really focused on janitorial, the other company is very focused on yard maintenance. Uh, but there's a contract out there that requires both, so they'll team up. And their cap capabilities, while different, they're very complementary. So that, that's a good thing. The government likes to see that. And also um, teams, like they say in the FAR, usually offer the best combination of performance, cost and delivery because each partner is usually pretty good at what their uh, main focus of business is. So government likes to work with teams. Uh, some more benefits to the federal government, it reduces administrative burden. So, um, you know, if they're separating, if they have contracts that require two different industries like janitorial and lawn care, um, they'd rather do that all in one contract and just have a team win it instead of having two separate contracts and they have to administer both of them. So that costs more money in administration. Again, with program management, more people, more time, uh, more expenses. But the big thing here is it helps contractor development, right? Contractors um, start, when you team up with other contractors, you get another contractor involved. Um, you know, either as a JV or even as a subprime relationship, they're involved in federal contracting now. They start learning how the federal government wants things done. They start learning the invoicing process. They start learning, um, uh, you know, where to put their employees, uh, how they should how they should be uh, doing the work, how the, what the government needs, and it puts another contractor basically into the pool of contractors of the defense industrial base. And the more contractors we have involved, the more vendors we have involved, the more competition there is, and hopefully prices go down, right? Because who's paying for all this? Taxpayers are paying for all this. Taxpayers are paying for everything the government does. So 
increasing efficiency and reducing prices for the next contract. That is something the government's always trying to do. All right, how does it benefit the small businesses? Uh, you can flip some of those things we said earlier to, to the small business as well. Um, but you can, again, complementary skills, resources, capabilities, you can maximize all that when you team up with another uh, company. Um, you can be more flexible, right? Um, you can be in two places at once because now you've kind of maybe doubled your workforce or and maybe you've doubled your geographic scope. It doesn't necessarily have to team with a company from Guam. You could team with an off-island company and you go after work outside of Guam, you know, so things like that can happen. Uh, you can minimize your risk, you know, as if you form an official joint venture, then actually the joint venture, all the members involved are equally liable. Um, if it's a prime sub relationship, the prime is still liable for the project. However, um, they, there are a little bit of risk mitigation they can do when they spread it out. You can fill in your gaps in past performance. And this is probably one of the biggest things when it comes to federal contracting. Federal contract, uh, the federal government wants to work with proven vendors. They wanna work with contractors who've had contracts before. Right? And so then that leads to the old uh, chicken and the egg situation. Well, how am I going to get a contract if I've had, I need some experience before? Well, you get that through teaming, through being a subcontractor on a project, right? Then you learn how the prime does things and how the prime works with the federal, federal government. And you start incorporating, it, incorporating that into your business. Uh, and then also you now have experience as, as being a sub on a federal project. And so now you can count that as your experience. And then you have past performance, right? Past performance is basically when you're graded on your experience. So if your prime has graded you, you know, excellent or uh, very good, and they've given you some testimonials, um, you can have all that um, going for you. Maybe um, going back to the janitorial and lawn care example, like I said, you're, you know, there's a contract that requires both and you're very good at janitorial, but you're not good at lawn care. So you team up with another company that has the lawn care aspect. They have the experience. They have the past performance of that. You form something called a binding teaming agreement, basically saying that, you know, we are, should we win this contract, company X is guaranteed to be the subcontractor right? That's a binding team agreement. It's different than the usual team agreement. The usual teaming agreement with the sub and prime is that the prime agrees to negotiate with the sub and hopefully they come to terms and that sub will be the subcontractor. Many times though, they don't agree to terms and that sub is not the subcontractor. It goes to someone else to be a subcontractor. But if you have a, a binding team agreement, then what that means is you are guaranteeing that, let's say on this janitorial lawn care contract, that that lawn care company is going to be the sub. And so the, all their past performance, all their experience that they've had as a um, lawn care company now becomes the team's experience. It becomes the team's past performance. Um, you can increase your presence. Geographic barriers can be overcome. So here um, we have Monty and um, uh, Jim on the line, but at AMI, Advanced Management, they teamed up with a company in the States, ASPEX, and they had a couple of joint ventures. I got this information off USA Spending. So this is all public information. And they've, you know, looks to me done pretty well in uh, getting some contracts in the States and, and, uh, and the volume of work seems to be pretty good. So you don't have to limit yourself to Guam with a team, obviously. It's proof for a positive right here that it can be done, team up with an off-island company and open the doors to all kinds of possibilities. There's tons of work going on uh, in, in different states. I mean, you think, you know, Guam gets a lot of spend, probably Department of Defense, Defense is gonna spend, I don't know, probably one and a half to $2 billion this year in uh, federal contracting on Guam. That's a small compared to DOD's budget, right? What's their budget? 750 million, uh, 750 billion, 720 billion, something like that. So that's very low. There's a lot of work happening in all, in all other states and even other countries. So you don't have to limit yourself to just Guam with a team. And of course, building relationships. Um, a small business is prime that deals with the government customer. Customer just, just meeting. Um, it's a chance for small businesses to learn how to do things and then become the prime and they start dealing with the government. So all the benefits for teaming there. Uh, so then with all these benefits, how can companies don't team, right? We don't see it as much as we would like. And it usually is, you know, these are the common things that happen. Uh, there's some kind of negative experience is usually the first thing. Some team got together and you know they got burned on a deal. They didn't get the uh, profits they thought they were gonna get. 
or they do, didn't do the work they thought they were going to do. Um, and so they had a bad experience, left a bad taste in their mouth, and they don't want to team anymore. That, and that happens, right? And the only thing I can say to that is when you're teaming up with a company, vet the company you're teaming with. Um, number one, you want to work with a company that you know. Very rarely do you just team up with someone you don't know, and then that relationship's going to work, right? It's, it's kind of like relationships in life. It's got to be people you know, and, and, and people you, you're, you're, you know exactly how they work. Uh, you understand what they're doing. You understand why they're doing things the way they do it. And it all works for you. And those are the best kinds of teams. So know the teaming partner that you plan on teaming up with. Uh, also, many times companies don't want to give up control. There are companies out there that they just want to do everything themselves. They don't like to, um, you know, if, once you bring on a teaming partner in, in either a prime sub relationship or a joint venture relationship, there will be some loss of control, right? Because you are, ex that partner is expected to do their portion of the work and you might not be able to control that. So some companies don't like that. Some companies want to have a direct relationship with the federal government, so they never want to be a subcontractor. Remember as a subcontractor, you're actually, you don't have a contract with the federal government. You have a contract with the prime, right? So your relationship is with the prime. Um, but some companies don't like that. They always want to be the prime. So, um, they don't want to be a sub. So they might um, get subs and as in that form of the team, but they won't be a, a sub on another contract. And again, for the companies who don't want to give up control and kind of like the lone wolves out there, they think they can do it all. They don't really see an advantage. Um, and then probably the last one here is um, this happens. I've, you know, I've, people have called me and told me this happened to them and I've seen it happen when I, in my private sector days. Uh, when I was working for an HVAC company and we would turn in proposals and get squeezed out and say, hey, what happened here? You know, uh, but that happens. Um, you, you put a proposal together to a prime and you, and you submit it and, and it seems like everything is going good, but you don't get the subcontract that goes to somebody else and you wonder, you know, what happened. And, so, you know, you hear things like um, price shopping and things like that. And, you know, it happens. It's not a good thing. Um, all I can say to that is if that's happening with that prime that you wanted to work with, maybe you don't want to work with that prime. Try maybe finding a different prime contractor. It doesn't seem like that prime contractor is doing things the right way. If you expect there was some, um, you know, a bad intent going on, but that it does happen. So, all right. So let's talk about a traditional teaming arrangement here. Traditional teaming, like I said, is the prime contractor and a subcontractor. That's the normal thing you see all the time. Usually uh, one business seeks out another and it's normally a large seeking out a small. Uh, for federal contracting, the reason for that is on larger contracts and I forget the threshold, um, but you know, it's in the probably 30, 50 million, something like that. Larger contracts, um, large businesses need to have a subcontracting plan they, and then they're graded on that plan and they have to submit that plan. So they have to use small businesses. So they have to have teams basically. And so that's why you see a lot of prime and sub relationships on these bigger contracts. Um, a team member acts as a subcontractor, right? Exactly upon the contract award. And then the socioeconomic characters is the team are driven by those of the prime. So in that situation where a large prime is seeking out small businesses because they need a subcontracting plan, that team is a large team because the, the, the prime is a large, right? Um, when there's, let's say, a hub zone contract, let's say um, the government needs um, some janitorial services and they've decided they're going to set aside this work and put it out to bid for hub zones only. Um, and let's say a hub zone teams up uh, with another small business, then that team will probably be considered small, right? There are some scenarios that might go against that, but usually uh, when small businesses team up together, the team is considered small. So that's a basic traditional teaming arrangement. Um, if you wanna know if your teaming arrangement is valid, the FAR kind of discussed this, um, but you know they don't really go into details of how exactly to put your team together. But basically if the arrangement is identified, and the relationships are fully disclosed. That's what the government wants to know. Um, the government, like I said, encourages teams. They don't like to uh, limit teams too much, but there are some limitations uh, to teaming arrangements. And usually it goes with uh, limiting the government's rights. So you can't put a teaming arrangement together and say, hey, um, 
uh, the, you know, you're going to limit the government's right to consent to subcontracts. Um, now, normally the government doesn't get involved in who your subcontractors are if you're the prime. However, some contracts, depending on the nature of the contract, maybe the sensitivity of the contract, um, maybe it's a building being built that's going to house top secret information or top secret or um, computer systems that deal with top secret information, something like that. Um, the government might in that type of contract say, hey, you know what, we have the right to consent to who you hire as a subcontractor. So if you have some kind of teaming arrangement with your um, subs that says, now nah, the government can't do that, I'm going to pick you anyway, that's not going to work. That teaming arrangement, it won't work. Um, determining, so also the responsibility of the prime. The prime is responsible for the project. So if they have a teaming arrangement where they shift all the responsibility down to the sub, that won't fly either. Um, the, the prime is responsible for the contract. So the government uh, can and will go after the prime uh, regardless of what the subcontractor is doing. Um, all right, more on limitations to teaming arrangements. So subcontracting itself has its own limitation. Now, what I'm gonna talk about here is directly related or I'm sorry, is only related to small business set aside contracts. And I don't think I quite discussed that yet, but the government awards um, contracts or decides on how they're going to put it, something out for, let's go back to the solicitation process. They usually do some market research. So let's say the government needs janitorial services to clean, I don't know, 10 buildings in the Navy base. And they're not sure on Guam or even across the nation who can provide this service. So they put something out known as a source of sought notice and they say, hey, um, you know, we're looking for small businesses that can do this janitorial work. So please let us know who you are, all your contact information, and then let us know if you're woman owned or if you're 8A or if you're hub zone or if you're service disabled veteran owned. Um, you know, give us some information about your team, tell us about uh, your experience and your past performance, basically a capability statement. And the companies all will send in their responses to those sources, that source of sought notice. The government will evaluate those responses and say, you know what, it looks like um, we have two or maybe three or five or whatever it is, but as long as we have at least two um, in a particular category, let's say we have at least two hub zones that can do this work, let's set this work aside for hub zones. So what happens is the contract, uh, or the, I'm sorry, the solicitation comes out and it'll be set aside for hub zone, meaning the prime contractor that's bidding on this must be hub zone certified. And so that's what we mean by um, a set aside, a small business set aside. So you can do a small business set aside for just regular total small business, uh, meaning it doesn't matter what category you are, but as long as you're a small business, you can be the prime on a small business set aside. And then you can take it down further and say, we're gonna do a woman owned only or a service stable vet, veteran only or an 8A only or a hub zone only. So those are the different small business set asides. Now, when it comes to that, people might think, oh, great. I might win that hub zone um, as the prime. I'm just gonna sub 100% of it to a large business. Well, you can't do that, right? You need to do the work. Uh, the whole point here of, this, of these small business set asides and all these different um, small business contracting and the goals is to get more small businesses involved. They don't want a pass through situation. The government doesn't want you to just give all the work to the large businesses because then the small businesses aren't growing. They're not learning. They're not becoming capable contractors to put all this, uh, to get more companies involved, to gather, you know, make sure there's more competition and make sure that prices go down. That defeats the whole purpose of everything. So there are limitations on subcontracting when it comes to small business set aside contracts. So for service and supply contracts, um, which let the janitorial example we're using, that would be a service contract. Um, so let's say it's a million dollar contract. You can't pay more than half of that million dollars if you're the prime to a sub um, if they're not similarly situated. So we'll talk about similarly situated in a, in a second here, but in general construction, you can actually subcontract up to 85% of that amount. So 850,000 of that um, uh, contract can go to a large business and you won't, you won't want any, any problems there. Especially construction, it goes down to 75%. So what do they mean by similarly situated? So if it's, it's a subcontractor that has the same small business program status as the prime. So let's say, go back to our janitorial example here, it's a hub zone set aside. 
and a company, a HUBZone certified company wins the project, company X, let's say, and they want to subcontract it. Well, in this case, they could, they could subtract, come subcontract at 50% of it, maybe to a large business if they want, but that's it. They got to do at least 50% of the work. And, you know, because again, they need to build up their skills. This, all this stuff is for small businesses to grow and become better federal contractors. Um, but let's say they want to subcontract more. Let's say that maybe they only can do 30% of this. Well, they could subcontract it to another HUBZone certified company. They could subcontract 70% of it to another HUBZone certified company because that comp company is similarly situated. They have the same categories, the same status. So that's a possibility. So that's what we mean by similarly situated. So, and these were just updated um, uh, maybe a, a few months ago, I think actually that this finally came into play. They've been talking about this similarly situated for, I don't know, five years now, but now it's actually in the rules. It's in the FAR and this is what you can do when it comes to um, subcontracting. So this is more opportunity to get small, more small businesses involved, team up together because you can subcontract quite a bit. You could probably subcontract all 100% of it to another small business. I don't know if anyone's ever done that, but the law does not disqualify that. All right. What are some elements of a teaming arrangement? So these are the basic uh, elements of a teaming agreement. It's got to be in writing. A, a, a verbal agreement is not going to work for federal contracting. There needs to be some kind of intent on the agreement. Um, you know, what's the purpose? Why are we doing this? We're going after this contract. Um, and then also is the agreement binding or non-binding, right? So is this just an agreement to negotiate and possibly you won't be the sub or is this an, a, a binding agreement where oh, we've already negotiated, you are going to be the sub should we win this contract? There's also sometimes exclusivity in there, right? Sometimes um, companies don't want subs to give their bids to other companies. I don't even know how enforceable that is uh, with respect to just regular Guam law. Um, but you see that sometimes. Proposal preparation is defined. So normally in a teaming arrangement, you talk about what the prime is going to do and what the sub is going to do, who is doing which portion of the work. Scope of work is clearly divided there. Um, proprietary information is protected. You should you know, always do that. If you're, if you're a sub teaming up with a prime and you have some proprietary information to make sure in your agreement, it's stated somewhere in there that whatever information you're providing that's proprietary, that it's protected, that the sub, I mean, that the prime is not gonna share that with anybody else. Um, there should be clauses to resolve disputes. Like I said, disputes happen all the time. Teams go south, uh, bad things happen. Um, so you wanna have some form of dispute resolution, whether it's gonna be arbitration or it's gonna have to go to legal court cases, whatever you're gonna do. And it should cover anything that could happen, you know, performance. What if, you know, the prime doesn't do their share or the sub doesn't do their share? What if payments aren't happening? Things like that. So uh, employee solicitation, right? Will the prime be able to um, hire your employees and, and take your employees away from you? Uh, you probably don't want that to happen to make sure you have that in your teaming agreement. Um, and then termination, what happens? Uh, or when does the team end, right? And normally the team ends if you don't get the contract, right? No, right, boom, the team's over. It really didn't even start. Or you do get the contract and you finish the contract or you finish your portion as the sub of the contract. That's when the team is over. So it all depends on which, which part of the contract you're doing. Uh, we have a template you can use. Uh, let me jump over to that real quick. Hopefully this works. I don't lose anybody. Uh, where is my teaming template? I think this is one. I can send this out or I will send this to everybody. Um, and I'm sorry, it's quite small. Let me make it a little bigger here. So this is a little, and I think this was a, in a service stable veteran owned, um, also even HUBZone was listed in here, but you can change all this information to whatever you want. But it basically has all the different things about um, the proposal preparation section, who's gonna do what, uh, division of responsibilities, uh, what's the relationship of the two companies, or it could be even more, three companies involved, uh, responsibilities again. So it's all in here. You can use this. But, you know, of course, anytime you want to put a document like, to, like this together, you probably want to run it by an attorney to make sure everything's in there and all the, all the stuff is in there. Usually, though, when it comes to federal contracting, 
Uh, the prime is going to have their template already. They're going to have their teaming arrangement. And so you just want to make sure you take the prime because they're going to give it to you and they're going to want you to sign it and, and um, put your information in there. And so run that by an attorney just to make sure everything's good and everything's on the up and up. Okay, so those are the key elements of teaming arrangements. Um, small businesses should avoid affiliation. Affiliation is basically when it looks like a company can control or has the power to control another company. Um, it doesn't matter if the power, if the control is actually happening, if they're actually being controlled. Um, but when it looks like a company can control another company, that's when we have issues. So this usually happens when um, it's a small business set aside contract. So the prime needs to be a small business and they team up with a large to be their sub, right? Because based on the, those subcontracting rules I showed you earlier, like a service contract, they could subcontract up to 50%. And let's say they do that, they subcontract 50% to the large, but let's say that 50% is all the work and the other 50%, which would be a high number, so it's uh, in this example, is more admin stuff and not really the contracts, right? There's just putting, it's just paperwork. Um, and it looks like, um, the prime, I mean, sorry, the sub, the large business sub is doing all the work. They might look at that and go, look, there's some affiliation here because um, something, the whole pur purpose is being defeated. The purpose of having the small business grow and uh, learn about federal contracting, um, it, that whole is going away because they're not really learning anything. They're not doing the work. And it looks like the large business is controlling the small. So if that's happening, that's where an affiliation comes into play. And if the SBA gets involved, they might say, hey, you know what? Looks like you guys are affiliated. We're going to break up this team and you guys are not going to be able to do this contract anymore. Um, so that has happened. It's happened on Guam. And so that's huge, the usual scenario. There's also another scenario which sometimes comes into play where you see that um, a small business and large business team up. And um, basically the small business, it's their only contract. They have no other work. So then it comes into play of, okay, what happens if that large business goes away? Well, then it's the small business dead in the water. Maybe they can't do business anymore. They'll be out of business. And then when that's happening, again, it looks like the large business can control the small business because they can really dictate to, to terms with them is because then say, hey, if you don't do what we tell you, we're gonna bail out and then that's it. So. Um, that's another ha thing that happens when it comes to control. So affiliation is something that should be avoided with small businesses, and there's ways to do this. Um, you can, uh, we talked about this, I think it was last week, uh, the mentor protege program. So if you want to team up with a large business, you're a small business, and you want to team up with a large business, and you want to avoid, make sure you avoid affiliation, go through the SBA's mentor protege program, get involved in that, get your plan approved, and then you and your large business partner can team up and go after small business contracts without fear of affiliation because as long as you're following the rules and following your plan, uh, your mentor protege program plan there, you'll be fine. So that's one way to do it. Um, or you just make sure you follow the subcontracting limitations and make sure you're doing your portion of the work. So um, some examples in here, um, some other things they look at is maybe a company, um, well, the big thing they look at is the sharing. So if you're sharing management with another company, you're sharing employees, you're sharing equipment, you're sharing facilities, that's going on. They're probably going to think, all right, there's some affiliation going on. This is, you know, these companies need each other. Um, they can't operate on their own. And, or, for, or if it looks like one of the managing partners or the directors or the owners of the company is also working for the other company, then there might be affiliation going on. So. Um, SBA will not just assume affiliation. They're going to look at the totality of the circumstances. They're going to say, all right, what's going on in this industry? What's going on with these two companies? What are they sharing? Um, do they have a federal contract? Is it affecting anything? And they're going to look at all the circumstances. And if it looks like, okay, it looks like one is controlling the other, that's when they're going to go, okay, they're probably affiliated. And uh, then things can happen, right? They could break up the team. They could say, hey, this is you guys are affiliated, you, you don't qualify for this small business contract anymore. Or maybe if it's two small business companies, um, usually that's fine, but they might say, hey, you know what, it looks like um, a lot of times they'll add the um, 
uh, right, to determine if you're a small business or not, right, you have to be small in your NAICS code. Sorry, I'm getting in the weeds here, but, uh, and each NAICS code has a, a threshold. And a lot of times that threshold is a annual, annual revenue threshold. So um, if those two companies are close to that threshold and they combine together and they're affiliated, so they'll combine their sales together and that puts them over the threshold, they might say, hey, you know, this team is not a small business. So that's a possibility as well. So just watch out for that. Um, all right, what's a joint venture? Joint venture is a type of teaming arrangement. It's just more of an official teaming arrangement. Um, it's basically when teams or persons or concerns, basically companies, um, they have an interest of getting together, contracting together uh, to carry out a single specific business venture for joint profit, right? So normally a joint venture, the companies, it could be two companies, but a lot of times you see three, four, five, six companies get together and they are going after a certain contract or maybe a certain group of contracts or they wanna be on a certain uh, Mac or something like that. Um, that's when they get together and form these uh, joint ventures. Uh, but it's not a permanent thing. Joint ventures don't last forever. There's a limit to them. Um, and yeah, I, think it, I think it's the three and two rule. Is that I mean, three contracts in two years, something like that, or two contracts in three years? I forget which way, um, but there's a rule to it. When you win the first contract, then the clock now ticks and you can win as many as you possibly can in three year period. Three years. The, okay. the three and two rule went away. Oh, okay. Thanks, Monty. All right. So here, here's a joint venture. Um, this is the, these are the large Macs that are happening on Guam. So this is a, again, these are all pretty much joint ventures. Again, it's a teaming arrangement and you can see that um, these large, large businesses themselves can't do these projects on their own and they team up. So we have the, the Big Mac going on right now. Um, I think the only one that's not a joint venture is Hensel Phelps. They're doing it all on their own. They probably have um, some, you know, very uh, first tier subcontractors that they use all the time across the country. So Black Construction, Tudor Perini, I mean, Tudor Perini is the parent company, right, for Black Construction. Cadell Nan, Cortec, H, there's a three person team right there. Gilbane, um, SMCC, ECC, another three person team. So when it comes to these larger, larger contracts and you can see the Big Mac has almost a billion dollars in it. Um, and then the Mamizu Mac, which is the Japanese funded portion of the, the marine base uh, construction going on and the, the marine buildup on Guam also has a billion dollars in it and so many of the companies here are also joint ventures but if you notice they're involved there's usually a japanese company involved in, in some of these joint ventures the reason for that is when it comes to the mamizu mac that money is coming from the federal government of japan um, for them sorry from the government of japan and so they have a hand in um how that money is being spent because it is their money or and just because just like uh on a regular Mac, like the big Mac here, it's the Department of Defense, it's the US federal government who decides how that money is being spent. So, but just wanted to show you here that um, joint ventures usually come into play on larger contracts. But as we saw earlier, like with uh, Monty and AMI, there's a, you can do joint ventures in small businesses as well. So let's talk more a little bit about here about joint ventures, the basic elements gotta be in writing, just like a teaming arrangement. Uh, the contract is in the name of the joint venture usually, right? So. The joint venture is a separate entity. It's a third party. It's a, so company A, company B formed together, company C. And that company is now a real business. It's its own business. It's gonna have its own uh, tax ID number. It's gonna register itself at SAM, right? It's gonna, it's going to um, be its own entity. So the joint venture has got to register in SAM. The joint venture is responsible for the contract performance. The joint venture members, so the company A and company B, they have, they're in privity of contract with the government, right? Because they're pretty much equal. They're individually equal liable for contract performance. And then they share the profits and risk of loss. Now that could be different. It might not be 50-50. It could be 60-40, 70-30, whatever it is. Um, however, they wanted to define it between themselves. So for small business, it gets a little different. Remember, um, there's always differences for small businesses. The government is always trying to um, uh, not only get more small businesses involved, but when they're involved, they make some special rules to make sure that the small businesses are learning and growing and becoming better federal contractors. So um, for small business, they can JV with another small business, no problem. There's no specific format for the JV agreement. 
Um, they can uh, 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 joint venture with an approved mentor, like I was mentioning earlier. And again, that would be, um, they have what, there would be a JV agreement and that was already approved by the SBA. For hub zone, it's pretty much the same. Um, and then the third requirement on the hub zone is the JV itself does not have to go through the hub zone certification process. It's just, I mean, the, the hub zone certified members are already hub zone certified. So by default, the JV is hub zone certified. Uh, for services able vet, the game, same thing. They follow the same rules as the hub zone. The SBA does, again, does not need to approve the joint venture that only comes into play um, in the Metro Protege program. And there again, the, in that program, the SBA is not approving the joint venture. They're only approving the Mentor Protege agreement. So, and that's when a small business is teaming up with a large business. So, but in these cases, these are all small businesses teaming up with other small businesses or JVing with other small businesses. For women owned, pretty much the same as, as the other ones we just saw. Um, the only difference here, I think the, the women owned must be designated as such in SAM. And you'll notice that there is a question in SAM if you're, if you're doing your SAM registrations, uh, your annual renewals, there's always a question there that says, are, are you part of a woman-owned joint venture? Or there's even one that says, are you part of a hub zone joint venture? For 8As, it's also pretty much the same, except there's a little, you know, a little tweaks in there. Um, like number two, the 8A small business must lack the capacity to form the contract itself. So there has to be a reason why that 8A is part of the joint venture. Um, and basically it's because it can't do it on its own. It needs to be part of the joint venture. Uh, the agreement must benefit the, the 8A small business. And then the only time the SBA has to approve the joint venture is if it's an 8A sole source set aside. So um, normally, again, they don't have, SBA does not need to approve these joint ventures for small business. These are the basic requirements. Um, so, you know, the, the purpose of the joint venture needs to be there. Uh, the small business should be designated as the manage, managing venture. Of course, if it's two small businesses, it's no problem. Uh, but then again, if there's a large involved, um, small business needs to be the one out front. Uh, the small business uh, has an RM, responsible performance. A PM cannot be previously employed by the mentor. So these are all the basic requirements. But basically what you're seeing here is that the small business needs to be doing a lot of not just the admin work, but a lot of the contract performance as, as well. So. Nothing too out of the ordinary here. Um, there's also an agreement guide I can send everyone and I actually will send it everyone. So let's take a look at that real quick. I'm gonna jump over. Um, so this is a joint venture agreement between ABC and XYZ and you can use this to put your joint venture together. And again, like I said earlier, anytime you wanna put one of these together, make sure you run it by an attorney just to make sure everything's there. All right, what's going on? So I'm just gonna page down here. So. This is pretty set up pretty simply. The, what's the name of the joint venture? What's the who's the managing venture? Who's going to be the project manager? Percentage of ownership, right? And I think this came from the mentor protege program. So if there's language like that in there, you could just take that language out. Um, distributive share, who, the bank account, who's going to be operating it, right? Uh, well, normally, it's it's in the small business partner if there's a large business involved. Contract oversight, source of labor. Everything's in there. All those little terms that were showed you on that slide earlier are all in here. So you can use this as a template for any type of joint venture agreement you want to make with another small business. Okay. Um, there's also a guide to this agreement. And again, it's related to the mentor protege program. But if you're not involved in that, you can, you can still use this guide because the guide is fine. It's just take out all the mentor protege language or ignore it basically. So what are some advantages? Why, why would you joint venture? Well, um, it's kind of, you know, this is kind of what with the team as well. Um, you look to the resources, the government wants to look to the resources of two or more companies to perform the work, which is always, like I said earlier, the government likes to work with teams. It's, it's better for the government to have more companies involved in the defense industrial base. Uh, but for joint venture members themselves, uh, a minority joint venture member can exert more control, right? If you're a sub to a prime on a normal teaming arrangement, you really don't have a lot of control. Now, you're going to do your part. But on a joint venture, everybody's, you know, the members of the joint venture are pretty much on an even par. They might not share the profits or the, or the work of 50-50, but when it comes to dealing with the government, they're both allowed to, right? They're both partners. Uh, the partner participating in the joint venture avoid any perceived stigma. So 
this is um more of a how shall we say this is more of a uh, when you're dealing with other contractors when you're you know you're going to the contractors association meeting you're going to the guam chamber commerce meeting and you're talking and marketing your company it's always seems to me it just perceived better by people when you say oh yeah we're part of a joint venture when you instead of saying oh i'm a subcontractor to whoever it's just it's just that the sound of a joint venture that the, those words just seem to be uh uh, associated with a, a better standing, you know, whether it is or not is debatable, but it, it's, it's just perceived that way. So, because it's the equal footing, I guess, is what makes it sound like that way. Uh, the other thing is uh, must versus should. So uh, CFR, which is the code of federal regulations, which is the FAR, FAR is part of that, obviously. Uh, 125.8 says evaluators must consider the past performance of all joint venture members. So, uh, when it talks about teaming, so what they're talking about here is when a team submits a proposal on a solicitation, there is an evaluation committee, right? There's a group of people who evaluate the proposals from all the people that are submitting their proposals. And when it comes to evaluating the past performance, and past performance, remember, is it's how you well you've done your job, um, the grades you've got, your exceptional graded, very good, good satisfactory, whatever it is, the testimonials you have from your completed projects. But when they're evaluating that, um, when it comes to joint ventures, the evaluation team uh, must consider the past performance of all the JV members. So they can look, they need to look at all the members. Whereas if it's just a, a prime and sub, they don't necessarily need to look at the sub, they could just look at the prime, right? It's, it's um, they should. But on that, when it comes to that, it usually says they should evaluate the past performance of all the members but when it comes to jvs the language in the far says they must so this is another higher standing when you're involved in a joint venture than the usual subcontractor and prime relationship all right some disadvantages uh lead contractor gives up substantial control yeah if you're going to do this all on your own you control everything but if you get involved in a joint venture you're no longer on your own so you are going to give up control um and there may be a liability you, you know the partners are liable in a joint venture for the contract now there can you can do a little bit of indemnification and get some insurance against your partners but um normally on a federal contract the partners of the jv are equally liable that's the normal situation so again work with team with joint venture with companies that you know you trust respect companies that you know you can work with, you like the way they do things and it fits in with the way you do things. Some tips again, research your tip, uh, just said that, research your potential teaming partners. You know, there's ways you can do this. Um, obviously the best time kinds of teaming partners are the ones you already know, the ones you've already worked with. But if you're brand new and you're get, just getting involved in government contracting, maybe you have some private sector experience uh, with companies that also work in the federal government and you like the things they did in the private sector, maybe team up with those companies. Um, you can research them if they've done um, federal contracting by going to usaspending.gov. You can go to that website and you can see, I mean, you won't see ratings or anything like that, but you can see um, the types of work they've done in the past and the contract amounts, they've they, the dollar amounts they've won in the past. So you can go to that website. Um, you can also see their profiles. And so there'll usually be um, some information about uh, what the company does, if they have any special equipment, maybe some experience they've had in the past will be listed. So that's one thing you can do. But definitely, you know, if you're if you're teaming up with somebody you don't know, which I really don't suggest, but if you're going to do that, make sure you vet them, make sure you research them. Um, base your team on the solicitations evaluation factors. We really didn't talk about this at all, but it's kind of ties back to when we do our responding to RFPs webinar. But uh, every RFP or every uh, yeah every RFP is going to have evaluation factors in it. Basically, these are the the area in the solicitation where it tells you how your proposal will be graded, right? So going back to the janitorial and lawn care maintenance example, and this requirement uh, requires both those types of services. Um, make sure that you when you put your team together, right? You get one of the, you know, you've got the janitorial side down, but you get a good lawn care company that can help you uh, in answering those evaluation factors and making sure your proposal meets those evaluation factors. 
Keep in mind the teaming requirements when going after small business set aside work. So again, those are the set aside requirements. Those are the subcontracting limitations. Those are the avoid affiliation types of things. So make sure you're keeping those in mind when you're putting your team together. And then decide if you wanna just do a team, a prime sub, right? Or you wanna do an official joint venture where you're actually forming another company. There's obviously more administrative and probably more cost involved in forming the joint venture, so. Uh, so those are some FAR and CFR uh, regulations you can read to learn more about this. Um, small business can form different types of team arrangements, obviously. Um, so we discussed all this already. So I'm going to open up to, um, that's pretty much it. Uh, anybody want to discuss anything or provide some suggestions or tips? I'm going to stop the share and uh, feel free to unmute yourself and or any questions. Well, you know, I'm always, uh, always have comments if I could. Yeah, you're share you're never shy well i just returned uh from uh the 2022 small business summit in honolulu oh wow and they had a a panel one particular panel out of several with there was attorneys that deal specifically with federal issues uh with contractors and they had the the head uh attorney for the small business administration there and they basically uh, started off by saying team, most teaming agreements do not hold up in court, no matter what jurisdiction. Now you say get a binding teaming agreement. You can write that word binding at the top and it doesn't make it any better. You know, you gotta, it's each jurisdiction that you're in, each state of the United States that you're in, the territory of Guam, whatever, you know, it has its own laws. Right. And so, you know, they said, the, they can write teaming agreements that will hold water in most every jurisdiction in the United States, and it'll be many, many pages because you're trying to take care of the things in the legal jurisdiction that you might play in. Right. Uh, but towards the end of it, they said the best thing to do is basically write your subcontract and make that your teaming agreement. We will team for this and if successfully obtained, this subcontract will go into effect, the one that's attached to it. And it just cuts right to it. There's none of this bait and switch because there's a lot of us out there who have had teaming arrangements. And all of a sudden in the end, when they win, they want to come and negotiate the price. No, we, we did that a few months back that we, yeah. you used it in the bid. Our price right. is solid, and, but it's their contract and you're their sub. And you right. get caught in that and you know you that's just what they said i'm just kind of relaying yeah. that information well, that, that so, makes a lot of sense yeah the uh, other thing i just want to encourage everybody even ourselves many years of, of contracting uh experience we didn't realize how important sources sought is uh every time you you talk to somebody like yourself or she's you know they they're trying to put it in one of these hub zone service disabled, woman owned or something. They're trying to fulfill their categories in there, but they need at least two uh, companies out there in that with that designation in order to legally go procure it in that woman owned or small disadvantaged, whatever. And uh, so encourage everybody that if you're interested in that procurement, uh, you better answer that source of thought and let them know that you have the credentials and you know, otherwise, it might not be and you missed an opportunity you were talking about the hub zone you know the requirements for certain entities with hub zone i was told by the nafac representative that uh they basically fulfill the entire nafac in guam because the whole island's a hub zone right so we have a contract that's island-wide with nafac that was a hub zone set aside and i was told by nafac that they procuring and services anyway, at least 50 to 55% of the procurements are hub zone. And that kind of fulfills Hawaii's and NAFAC Southwest, NAFAC Mid-Atlantic, because uh, Guam just has this special thing. They have a very tough time across the nation getting right, hub right. vendors. Yes. Uh, J, uh, joint venture teams. Uh, one thing I you didn't say, each NACE code, so when they put out and you use janitorial, for example, so janitorial has a NACE code that 
if you're a small business, it's 18 million or less. And if you're 18 million or less, then you're a small business for mm -hmm. that NACE code. You can bid on a small business janitorial. So if they set a small business aside for women owned and you do a joint venture with a woman owned, then their revenues, your joint venture partner and your revenues don't add. So well, if they're right. small and you're small, yeah. then the JV small. Now, if you if they're not similarly situated, so I'm, it's a woman owned set aside and I get somebody who's just a small business. Now I got to take their revenues, right. add them to my revenues. And all of a sudden we have a combination that's above 18 million. Oh, well, this joint venture can't bid on it. And that's a real important, real important aspect. Right, right. Of things. Uh, the, the template uh, that on the SBA website for joint ventures, yeah. they said, don't trust it. We have not really? updated it. So what we've done, because we've done joint ventures in the past year with uh, companies in our women-owned, services-abled, and hub zone, uh, and all in the SBA website, every clause you need is in there. So right. we pull those clauses out. We put them in our joint venture. We send it to our attorney. Our attorney says, this, this doesn't adhere to Guam law. And mm -hmm. we said, we're not we're not trying to adhere to Guam law. We're trying to pass the SBA mandate. You have to have these things in your joint venture or they're not going to salute. And so he said, well, if you have to have it, you have to have it. I'm just, I'm just your attorney. I'm telling you this, this wouldn't hold up in, in the local court, but it'll hold up, I guess, in district court. I don't know. So uh, all the clauses are in there and they're, they intend to update their templates at some time, but uh, don't exactly use them and i don't know if your template came from them or whatever but be be careful and just look at the clauses it, it tells you if you're going to be a woman-owned joint venture an sdvob joint venture an 8a joint venture, you got to have these in it just put right. them in it all right right yeah, yeah no that's that's true no that you're right the template i believe is an old one so that's good to know i didn't know they were going to update it so but yeah you're right always run it by an attorney that's okay, and then on a prime sub relationship, that always remember if you have a prime, if you're the sub to the prime, and and this thing goes south, it's all the prime's problem. You're not holding the bank. You're not liable. Uh, you also don't well, have any authority to talk to the contracting folks or anything. You you only deal with the prime. So right. that, and so when you form the joint venture, and now you're both. If this thing goes south, you're both in trouble. Right, both of you. So, you know, researching who your partner is, uh, is easy, sometimes easier said than done, but I'd get on the internet, just type their company name in, I'd go to DS, the, the dynamic small business search engine and see what it says, you know, do they really have the certification that they say they have, right. you know, what contracts uh, are listed there that they perform. And uh, that's it. Uh, Sorry for taking so much time. No, no, thank you very much. Though everything was great there. Those are all good tips. That's yeah, you're right. Oh, well, we're going to incorporate that into something. our next time we do this. <laughs> Boris, I want to uh, try to get clarification on something because I'm so slow witted. Um, if so, we're a hub, we're a hub zone company, and we're going to bid on a uh, non Guam hub zone bid, for example, in well, let's say San Francisco, and so we bid on the thing. Um, what's the source of employees to meet the hub zone requirements for the actual operating of the contract? They have to be hub. See what I'm saying? I mean, the work sites down there. They have to reside in a hub zone. Right? Sorry? They have to reside in any hub zone. 35, right? Any hub zone. It doesn't have to be a hub zone in, in near San Francisco or anything like that. Yeah. Just okay. 35%, at least 35% of the employees have to reside in a hub zone. That's right. to become a hub zone, not 35% of the employees that work on the contract don't have to live in a hub zone. None that's, of them. And that's my question. Zone. Oh, that's, you know what? I don't, is that true? I don't know. I'd have to look that up. Yeah. yeah it, uh, you're, you're a hub zone. They're, they're doing it to a hub zone. 35% of your company's employees need to reside in a hub zone. Not 35% so of the employees that are working the San Francisco hub zone contract because they, we would have no hub zone employees there. 
That's true. But I, I, then I you add those there. those employees. Say we have fifty employees to the two hundred I currently have in Guam. Right, right. The do you have a percentage? Well, yeah, I got two hundred out of two hundred fifty, so I think I meet it. You know, do the math. Yeah. And, and if you, you get yeah, a contract, I, a hub zone never, contract, and that takes you out of hub zone now because of the employee numbers doesn't work. You still get to have that contract until it expires with the new rules. Yeah, yeah. know yeah. I gotta look or at that. When you got out of it, the first option you know, you don't qualify anymore. You're you're gone. But now the SBA says no, you can keep it because the day it was awarded, you were certified. But because you won it, now the numbers don't work. But you get to keep the contract till it expires. Mm -hmm. That's you know that's good. I I wasn't aware of that, and I'll have to look that up. So. <laughs> But if I asked you that question, you'd come back with the right answer because you research. You are phenomenal. <laughs> you've been you've been a godsend to to our company and, and others in Guam. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. That, that is a great. That's a good point. I didn't even. Yeah, I didn't even. Uh, I don't think I've ever had that question asked. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that makes sense. That makes sense. That uh. The 35% is just to get the certification, not afterwards. Well, you're supposed to maintain it as well. So I guess the, the limitation would be if the contract was quite large and you needed a lot of employees in that area and now you have, you can't meet the 35%, there might be an issue. No, it's, and it's similar to uh, 8A status. As long as you won that 8A status in that period of time you were 8A, and that yeah. contract that you wanted on carries on. I mean, we were on one that carried on many years after our 8A expired. You right, get right. to keep it. You're not 8A anymore, but you get to keep it. Well, the same thing with HUBZone. You know, that contract may have thrown you out of the HUBZone program, but right. because you want it with it, you get to run it to the end. And at that time, you're not certified HUBZone anymore. You know, so right, you can't right. go, you can't do the recompete. Right, right. Very interesting, yeah. Last thing, with this lockout, with the um, uh, entity certification, the clause at the top of Sam, when you it says uh, we're going to slow down and we we don't know how long it's going to be. Oh yeah. Um, what all do you, do you find blocked in the the website? I'm finding there's a lot of things that just don't seem to work. Uh, what do you mean? I mean, like searching for uh, different uh, bids and uh, things like that. The flexibility of uh, the old Sam uh, beta dots beta Sam Sam beta. Uh, FBO .gov. I, haven't, yeah. I, haven't found, I haven't found an issue at all when searching for opportunities. Okay, we, uh, we find all the Guam ones, and um, you can search. You know, using a keyword, you can search uh, using a Nate's code. You can search all that. Okay. Stuff. So well. you're not finding any blockages caused by that? No, I'm not, no. Okay. Yeah. Jim and I, we get confused because we subscribe to another service and we have challenges every once in a while with that. And so you may be talking uh, about doesn't have challenges. I have the challenges. Yeah. Well, I the challenge is, is making me understand what I don't understand. <laughs> Back and forth, yeah. May, I don't know, yeah. I don't know, that'd be interesting, whatever the service you're subscribing to, if there's Guam-related work on that service that doesn't show up on SAM, that would be interesting. No, no, everything that they, everything they have shows up on SAM. Okay, yeah. all right. Because so. they're, all their stuff, when they go out and investigate and put on, they always put the SAM link within ah, there. I and uh, yeah, so th the two together, is, because we've been in the business, we're in our 32nd year, yeah, and we're going the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, um, we'll be doing a, a SAM webinar probably first week of May, and I'm gonna we'll talk about the new procedures and what's going on. Hopefully, they have some stuff clear, cleared up by then, but um, it's not looking good, yeah, it's a mess, it's it's a mess, yeah. It's not just us, so um, <laughs> that's the silver lining. It's everybody. It's not just Guam. <laughs> you know, if I could interject that while I was in Hawaii, 
uh, there's a somebody at the SBA office there that we worked with for many many years. His name's Michael Youth. Others yeah. on the on this presentation may not know him, but uh, Boris, he could not be more complimentary about you and what you do for us. Uh, he thinks it's far superior than other uh, PTACs in other areas. And I'm not saying that just so you will do more stuff for us, even though <laughs> you never say no. And I want you to continue that way. But uh, uh, you, you're held in very high esteem in the SBA Honolulu District Office. Uh, that's great to hear. Yeah. Michael Youth is a great guy. I'll, I'll send him his bonus check. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people are complaining about him because you know, they feel that others in the office should do a lot more. It seems like he does everything for everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's good. That's, that's like a, a rocket. That's a government thing, uh, right? Wasn't there a movie about something like that? About where yeah. a, a guy was new to the job and he's doing so much and the first things someone stepped out of his cubicle and looked at him and said, hey man, you need to slow down. <laughs> You're giving us all a, a, bad, a bad reputation. <laughs> But no, no, Michael Hughes is great. He's great. In fact, the thing tomorrow, I think he's going to be the one doing it. Uh, the the SBA Hawaii's workshop on an introduction to all the different small business set asides and all the eligibility requirements. Because he did Doesn't it. Know it's last, good Friday he did it last month. Yeah. Pardon me. Doesn't he know it's Good Friday here? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but anyways, all right. So, um, any other questions out there? No. Thank you, Boris. Thank, thank you, guys. Yeah, well, thank, thanks, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you next week. Where we'll be talking about um, another one of Monty's favorites, the Service Contract Act. <laughs> hey, it's a good document. Yeah. So we'll be talking about that next week. We'll talk about the uh, the FAR related to that and all the requirements related to that, especially um, the minimum wage requirements. So we we took that. Uh, and incorporated into a law, as I expressed it. Now, Gov Guam uses yeah, it for service that. contracting. Yep. And one thing I, of interest now, because we're just putting a bid together, that the $15 minimum wage is now going to be applicable. Uh, where before we, we started contracts and we have to wait till the first option year. Mm. And that, so that minimum wage for service contract act, minimum wage. Uh, and in the janitorial category right now, they get $9.54 an hour besides the $4.50 of health and welfare. And that $9.54 an hour is going to go up to 15 That's a big jump. Yeah. That's pretty good. I think I'm going to stop this job and go on base. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll send you an application. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yep. Take care, boys.